What I propose to you in this last session is a quick tour around the world at, and looking at what initiatives have been uh, put in place in different countries and how Gilead Access Program has contributed to uh, some of these. So um, I'll start with a quick uh, history about the genesis of the Gilead Access Program. Uh, we started with a bold um, and ambitious mission, which is to grant access to Gilead's products in, to, for all patients who need them and everywhere they live, regardless of their economic status. And how we did that, before I go to that, I want to show you a quick video about a campaign we ran this summer during the African Football Cup in, uh, in Egypt. So please, 30 seconds to uh, see the, the short clip. So that's, so that's um, the kind of initiatives we, we support because awareness is definitely one of the uh, main issues that we face as we, uh, as we go towards uh, elimination in various countries. So the, the Gilead Access Program, now called Global Patient Solutions, was designed to cover 140 countries uh, of lower and middle income uh, level in terms of economic means and built on a couple of uh, guiding principles. Responsibility, obviously, given the, the important seriousness of the issue, but also um, partnerships and sustainability. If you saw Marc Boulier's summary earlier, he mentioned the importance of partnerships in order to tackle such important issues as the elimination uh, of hepatitis in certain territories. And sustainability, because um, we want this type of initiatives to last, and we have been actually uh, with this program since over 15 years now. It started all in 2003 at Gilead in Foster City, um, where um, it was realized that patients with the HIV, the vast majority of them were in the south, while the molecules were in the north. And so the access program started at that, at that time. Um, we started by licensing the Gilead molecules to generic manufacturers in India with the purpose of uh, increasing volumes and lowering the price. Then in 2011, Gilead was the first company to join the uh, medicines patent pool a United Nations-derived organization that accelerates access to uh, essential medicines. Other companies have joined since. Um, and then that really were the initiatives that allowed us to, uh, to reach over 12 million patients, as you can see at the end of the timeline, uh, being treated today by a tenofovir-based combination. And we did the same for hepatitis C. So as soon as Safosbivir was uh, available, uh, we provided the, the tech transfer to generic manufacturers. Um, and today, over 2 million uh, people are treated on a Safosbivir-based combination. And the approach is really based on two systems, if you want. One is tiered pricing, which basically means we lower the price of our molecules to uh, fit with the economic means of the countries. And the second is the generic licensing that I just mentioned. This is how we look at the various countries. Obviously, disease burden is important, and we did this initially around the HIV epidemics. Um, so obviously, countries like South Africa will have a much higher disease burden uh, than countries in North Africa, for instance. And then the, the economic means of the countries are also a key driver for us to um, uh, provide products that will be affordable. And the result is as follows. You can see the sharp drop in pricing for here, this in grades, the tenofovir price. In 2006, it was uh, at around $17 per, per bottle per month. Um, and today, it's at below $3. 
Same thing for a tenofovir FTC combination. And this is thanks to all these guys here, which are generic manufacturers from India and China that have increased the volumes, um, competed amongst themselves, and drove uh, pricing down. Same picture on hepatitis C products. So all our products are part of this program, all the sofosbuvir-based combinations. And today you can see some uh, uh, much more affordable prices um, in, in developing countries. So that's the, the frame, if you want. Now, I'll, I'd like to share with you a few examples where I think uh, there are some lessons learned and some, um, actually, uh, correlation to what we've seen in Denmark. And, um, and you may find some, some uh, interesting uh, learning. So we'll start in, in Mongolia, uh, the Akangi uh, Liver Disease Project which was a collaboration with the local government of the province to uh, screen all adults aged 40 to 65. We found an HCV prevalence of 19.6% and, um, and over 99.7% um, of people were treated with fosvir lidipasvir combination. Uh, so this type of project is uh, handled through our clinical group. And um, we did something similar in Georgia, where we partnered with the Georgian government, the US CDC, to help establish uh, the Georgia Elimination Project. I know a few representatives from Georgia are at this conference. And, uh, and it's, it's certainly been a, a fairly fruitful journey, because uh, to date, more than 40,000 people have been uh, treated and, and cured with, uh, with the Gilead products. Awareness is also a key uh, aspect, obviously. We see a lot of uh, cases where uh, physicians tell us we can't see patients anymore. Uh, and the reality that we all know that patients are there, they just need to be aware and driven into care. And so uh, we partner in this case, this is an example for the World Hepatitis Day on July 28th, with the Ministry of Health of Benin and uh, CNLSTP to uh, provide information and, uh, and spread the message that it's a serious issue, it needs to be addressed, and there are uh, therapeutic solutions for it. Egypt, obviously, everyone has, uh, knows about the uh, incredible Egyptian journey in the fight against hepatitis C. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time on Egypt, only to say that it's an effort that started many years ago and that is very much sustained over time. And this is an example, uh, as of November, the launch of uh, Vosevi, the triple combination for salvage uh, in Egypt, has made the frontline newspapers because it was considered such an important uh, event. Uh, on the top, you see a program that Gilead sponsors for nurses on TV in Egypt. Um, and, and the results are definitely spectacular. As you know, 50 million Egyptians have been screened and over 3 million have been, have been treated. So it's a quite uh, a remarkable, remarkable achievement. Last example is going to be, I'm oh, no, sorry, just first, uh, another, another angle is the channel that we use with, um, through companies, actually. So we, uh, this is an example we, uh, of a campaign we ran in, uh, in Côte d'Ivoire, and it's going to run in Cameroon. And so we use the, the channel of companies um, because they have, a, obviously, a, a workforce that they want to see in good health, and so providing support for more of a public health approach. So we look at HIV, hepatitis B and C, diabetes and hypertension. Um, and so people go through a screening uh, and, and uh, diagnostics and orientations and physicians are present, etc. So And always, as you can see at the bottom of this poster, uh, always in partnership with uh, various organizations, NGOs, ministries of health. Here in this case, it's the UNAIDS. Last example is Rwanda. I think Rwanda we don't talk too much about, and when we were discussing with Tariq and Olivier when preparing, we thought that it might be interesting to share the journey that uh, this country that is slightly bigger than Denmark in population has taken. Um, and interestingly, you'll see some similar issues 
Um, and so I'd like to thank my um, uh, Dr. Janvier Soromundo for sharing the next few slides. He's the director of the Rwanda Biomedical Center uh, in Kigali. So again, Rwanda started their journey against hepatitis C almost a decade ago. They realized the importance of the high prevalence and established the hepatitis unit at the Ministry of Health. And they've been building up since then. And you'll see the approach they've taken, both on task shifting and capacity building, that is yielding incredible results, in, in my view. They worked on price for acquiring both diagnostics and medicine, and today they are able to uh, get a total cure for about $80. So all of that thanks, obviously, to the uh, generic manufacturers that are able to provide cheaper, uh, cheaper medicines, and the diagnostics manufacturers who are also, drop, also dropping their, their prices. So this is how they went about. Uh, their capacity building. So it started off in 2015 with only four specialists in the country. And you can see how complicated the patient journey was um, with first consultation at the, health, at the reference uh, health center, then going up the, the ladder, then looking at uh, first dose of treatment, then coming back for second dose and back for the third dose. So really cumbersome and complicated. Capacity building continued and they trained 20 specialists, but most importantly, they shifted the, the responsibility toward GPs and simplified the patient flow. So we went from the you know, health center and hospital and district hospital only, again, to make it easier. But that was not enough. So this is 2016, 2019, more GPs trained. And now we're seeing the introduction of nurses, interesting the role that nurses have been taking in, in this country as a, as a central player into the, the treatment of hepatitis C. And you can see the patient journey now with a simple patient home to health center. Uh, screening at the health center, viral load sample collection, results and treatment initiation in one step, and viral load collection SVR12. It's pretty efficient. And that's the, the target in 2020, 505 nurses, lab technicians, and data managers. That's the, also the other interesting part, is that all the way, and this is something we see also in Egypt, the Egyptian program, where people are collecting information and generating really valuable information. Obviously, um, as mentioned here, specialists still take care of the complicated cases, but in the, in, as you can see, GPs are prescribing at the central and provincial level, and uh, nurses are prescribing at the district level. So quite uh, a progressive and, and different approach. So that's the, the Rwandan story, and that will be my last example. Then again, insisting on capacity building and task shifting. Um, and uh, my friend Papa Salif saw here, uh, knows very well the impact in the world of HIV of task shifting because really it empowers other actors to take care of, uh, of patients in a setting where they can actually have a, a very important impact. So the key driver and probably the commonality among all the examples I shared tonight is really the political will behind all of this uh, because none of this will have happened in all of these countries without a very strong political will. And I think I'm really happy to share with you the fact that uh, next month um, in Addis Abeba, the African Union, the heads of state, will endorse the first declaration on viral hepatitis. So that's a really important commitment. I think the examples that uh, we described have been uh, good uh, illustrations of what is possible to be done when there is a political commitment there is goodwill and, uh, and good partnerships to, uh, to achieve the, the target of elimination. So with that, I'd like to, to close. And as mentioned, uh, the key, the two, I think probably the two important key messages here is, uh, are the, the last two bullet points on political commitment as the cornerstone for hepatitis C elimination and then the, the learning from the HIV story on both awareness of the general public, hence the little clip at the beginning for the, using the football vehicle, um, and then task shifting in order to unburden 
the uh, hepatology specialists. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Akram. We acknowledge your efforts, your motivation for the access program and uh, uh, the possibility to treat patients worldwide. So thank you very much. I think that we have time for questions that people will share with you their experience. They will ask questions. I think you have the opportunity to have Akram there. He can respond to many questions. So please feel free to ask. So first, uh, Mustafa, please. Just uh, one uh, new experience will start in Morocco. You know, the cost of uh, PCR in Morocco is so expensive. And many patients cannot go to treatment because cannot pay for PCR. Correct. Now we will start a program in Morocco. We have discussed this one month before with the help of Gilead and uh, Roche Diagnostic, where all are implicated in this program. The patient will have PCR free, all PCR free. And the cost of treatment will be very cheap. And I guess with this, program with the help of Gilead and I think Roche Diagnostic also is, the, is in the program. Maybe you can treat more and more patients. We have calculated that all biological examination like transaminations, all things we need, PCR, maybe cost as 30, 40 percent of the cost of whole and can so, be so, an obstacle. So, so in the past we were taking about high price of drugs, but now the, is the yeah, price of the global the, and the, the yes, blood tests and everything. is still Correct. expensive now. Okay, so I can't. I think that's absolutely. So I think that Morocco is probably a, another case study we will share at the next so, meeting, I hope, because uh, it's really on its way. <laughs> so thank you. We have selected some cases. Of course, many countries are very important, but thank you also for sharing with us Rwanda, which was very important. Amadou. You're traveling everywhere, you know <laughs> everything. Please, uh, we want to learn from you. What has been the more difficult things that you have done and what, how you overcome? What is the most important message that you want to give to the attendees to I achieve think, elimination in, in Africa? Yes, I think uh, Akram pointed it out. Um, I believe uh, the politics, the politics are very important in the whole equation. And I, uh, you know, I also think one of the other aspect that Agram pointed out and that the previous speaker uh, spoke about is decentralization, task shifting. I think here we need to take a page out of the uh, HIV playbook and apply it with hepatitis because we don't have enough experts to take it take care of the millions of patients. So those are two things that I've noticed throughout my travels. But things are getting better on both, uh, on both scores. So decentralizations and politics willing. Correct. Political will, absolutely. Task shifting, yes. 